Hi everybody, today is going to be the first of our online lectures that we're going to use to give us a little bit more time in class to work on some example problems. So today's topic is the Reynolds Transport Theorem and this is our introduction to this uh, concept that it ties into thermodynamics and conservation principles. So those of you who had uh, thermo with me should see some familiar things here. So the big power of the Reynolds Transport Theorem is that it lets us relate the Lagrangian and Eulerian perspectives of fluid mechanics that we discussed last time. So the Lagrangian perspective, remember, this is where we follow one packet of mass as it moves through the flow. Even if it changes size and shape, we always follow that packet of mass and we treat it like a particle that's moving. The Eulerian perspective this is where we're tied down to some region that we're interested in instead of some sort of fixed packet of mass. The Eulerian perspective, it can still involve a change of size and shape, but the big difference is this guy right here, that mass might cross the boundary now, where mass never crosses the boundary of the Lagrangian approach because that is fundamentally one packet that we're following. So, we're going to apply names to these, and they're the same names that we used in thermo. For the Lagrangian approach, we're going to call that a system because it has constant mass. And for the Eulerian approach, we're going to call that a control volume because it's a region that we're interested in, not the substance within it. Now, the control volume approach is really what's natural for looking at fluid mechanics. If I have a pump, I don't want to follow every packet of fluid through that pump. I want to look at the pump and look at what comes in and what goes out. So that's a control volume. Unfortunately, all of our experience with physics really applies to systems and not control volumes. So if I look here at Newton's second law, this sum of forces equals ma only applies to a system. It doesn't apply to a control volume. So it's natural to look at control volumes. Our physics relates to systems. What do we do? Well, what we can do, we need to start off with by defining what kind of property we want to track as the fluid moves around. So what we're going to do is define B to be any extensive property. Remember, extensive means that it depends on how much of the substance there is. So that could be mass, momentum, volume, energy, or any other number of things similar to that. Then what we're going to do is define an intensive version of the same thing that we're going to label lowercase b, and that's an intensive version. And remembering back to thermo, whenever we have an extensive property, we can divide by the mass to get an intensive version of that property. And that's what we're doing here. So by definition, little b is equal to big B over m. One other thing that we can look at and it gets uh, the Reynolds Transport Theorem approach, the name Integral Control Volume Analysis. What we're looking at is a certain volume, and we can talk about integrating over that volume to get the B for the whole system. So we look at our little b, we multiply that by the density, which is kind of like the mass, and then we integrate that over the entire volume, and that gives us the total amount of B in that system, or we could do this something similar for a control volume. Okay, so what I want to look at here is how we're going to lay this problem out uh, just looking at an example system and control volume. So what we're going to look at is here there's some time t0, we've got a control volume and our system is going to be defined as the mass in that control volume. So the system and the control volume coincide initially then what's going to happen is we're going to allow some time dt to go by and the control volume is going to stay stationary but the system will have moved so see our system has moved out here to the right it expanded a little bit it changed its size and shape but the control volume stayed stationary alright that's a great start and that's going to let us begin this analysis mathematically so the way we're going to look at this is to look at what's going on at time t0 plus dt. So we've got our system has now moved out here to the right and if I look I can imagine here in my control volume this region Roman numeral 1 is mass that had to 
enter my control volume to replace the system mass that left. So that's coming in from the left. I also am going to notice that my system now has this portion that's outside the control volume and I'm going to call that Roman numeral 2. And so these regions, Roman numeral 1, which is the mass that entered the control volume that's not part of the system, and then Roman numeral 2, which is mass within the system that has exited the control volume, these are going to be important in our accounting. So let's look at it mathematically. Here we go. At our initial point, time t, we can see that the amount of B that's in the system and the amount of B that are in the control volume, these are the same. Because they're on top of each other, they coincide. We're happy. Now what I'm looking at, though, is as a little bit of time has gone by, what is my B in the system now? And so this is how we're going to write it. B in the system, remember, that's what's in this green thing. That's equal to B in the control volume minus what's in region 1, because that's not part of our system. So that's right here. And then we're going to add on this part in region 2, which is not part of the control volume. Okay, so that's what we've got. Our B in the system is equal to the control volume minus B1 plus B2. This is total common sense, just looking at our picture. Well, what we want to do is now look at how this changes with respect to time. And you can probably see that we're going to get into calculus here. So if I look at how B changes with respect to a change in time dt, well, here's how B changes over these two times. Here's how my B in the CV changes with respect to these two times. And I only have my uh, B1 and B2 happening at the future time because those uh, aren't relevant when my control volume and my system overlap. These guys only show up in the future time. So what we're going to do here is take a limit when dt goes towards zero. That's what we should remember from calculus. Uh, ties into taking a derivative. And what that's going to mean for us is that in that instant when dt is zero, the system and the control volume will still coincide. So it'll let us be looking at the same volume, but we might have different changes in the B that's in the system and the B that is in the control volume because of these boundary terms. So, when we look at doing this derivative, we see that the for the things that occupy a volume, which are the system and the control volume, when we take the limit as dt approaches zero, we get the difference divided by dt. That's just the definition of the derivative. So I'm going to write, that's the derivative, the change in uh, the B in the system with respect to time. Notice I use a capital D because this is the material derivative because the system is a Lagrangian viewpoint uh, thing. So when we look at the control volume, we see that the terms are the same. It's still a definition of the derivative. Only difference is we use the partial derivative notation. You don't really need to get caught up in this is the material derivative, this is the partial derivative. That's kind of minute math. Uh, but it is helpful to help remind us that this is Lagrangian and this is not. If we look at the two terms that are the boundary terms, the B1 and B2, those are going to, in the limit, go to look something like this. So we're going to have a row AV. Remember that that's basically the mass flow rate. And then times our little b, which is the uh, amount of the property per unit mass, or the intensive property. So we're going to call that b dot in to reflect the fact that that's the rate at which b enters due to mass flow. And then below we have the opposite sign, rho a v b2 and that's b dot out. So if we put these together in our equation, we get the rate of change of b within the system with respect to time equals the rate of change of b within the control volume with respect to time plus the stuff that crosses the boundary, b out minus b in, in this case. So this is similar to our first law of thermo, for those of you who had thermo. Um, and this is an important fact because what this really represents is conservation of B within the system when we look at the control volume. 
And that's what allows us to relate these two perspectives. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so we need to generalize this a little bit because that last equation we just looked at only deals with uniform surfaces and uniform areas for the inlets and outlets and uh, uniform velocities as well. So that's a little bit of a simplification. We want to be more general. So the way we're going to do that is to draw this arbitrary area in the flow that we'll call a control surface and that represents a boundary to a control volume. And then we'll look at a little portion of that that we'll call dA. So dA is a differential area within our control surface. Now, at that point, we have two vectors. One is V, the velocity coming through the surface. And that could be going in any direction because this is just an imaginary surface in the flow. The other vector we see, N hat. That is a vector that is perpendicular to the surface at the point dA. It also has a magnitude of 1. So N is defined to be positive when it's coming outward from the surface and with a magnitude 1 it makes it a unit normal. Okay, so that's what we call that. What we're going to do is write our flow rate of B out of the system as an integral with respect to area. So we're going to integrate over this entire surface here with respect to the area dA and the thing that we're going to integrate is rho times B which is the property and then V dot N hat. So remember V dot N hat gives us a dot product so the dot product gives us the component of V that is along the direction N hat, and only that component. We don't have uh, the component that's normal to N hat, so that only gives us V in that direction. If our V is flowing along the surface, perpendicular, or uh, I should say tangent to the surface, then we know that V dot N right here goes to zero. Remember from math class that we can write our v dot n as the magnitude of v times the magnitude of n, which is just 1. So it's the magnitude of v times the cosine of theta between these. So if they're perpendicular, v is tangent, n is perpendicular to the surface, that gives us a theta of 90 degrees, and that would mean that v dot n is 0. The other cool thing is that this works for both inlets and outlets. So let's say I had my V going the other way and it was flowing into the system. Now my angle is going to be something larger than 90 degrees like this. So there's my N and here's my V and my theta is now this guy in between them. So we can see that that's greater than 90 degrees so that would give us a negative number and I can say that my V dot N is less than zero. So this guy covers inlets and outlets because of that dot product that we get. This one integral over the entire surface of the control volume gives us all the inlet and outlet flow. So this is cool. It lets us write our equation, the Reynolds transport theorem, like this. So we're going to say the rate of change of B within our system with respect to time. The system is the moving packet of mass. That's equal to the rate of change of the stuff in the control volume. So this is the integral over the control volume of rho times B. That's the amount of B in the control volume. Then we have the integral over the control surface of rho B V dot N dA. So this is what we just saw, that that is the inlet and outlet stuff. So we have the change within the system equals the change within the control volume plus the stuff that crossed the boundary. So this should make total sense to us. This is right out of thermo. What we're describing is the transport and conservation of B due to the flow. And it also relates our Lagrangian and Eulerian perspectives because remember we have this guy on the left hand side which is a Lagrangian perspective and then this control volume guy on the right is an Eulerian perspective. So we're relating these two and what we see the difference is is the stuff that flows in and out of our control volume. That is where we get the difference between Lagrangian and Eulerian. So last thing I want to show you really quick is just two problems that we're going to discuss in class. And what we're going to focus on is how do we find this V dot N hat dA. 
because that's going to be an important skill and we're going to use that later once we start talking about specific properties. Right now we're really general, we're just saying oh B could be anything, but later on we'll apply specific properties like mass or momentum to B and see what happens. So for now we want to learn how to calculate V dot N hat DA. So one way we're going to look at it is for this guy which just has a bunch of nice flat inlets and we can imagine uniform velocities so we can think about that and then the other problem we're going to do in class is to look at V dot N hat for a cylinder in the flow a cylindrical control volume with my flow coming in sideways through that cylinder so to do this we're going to have to look at N hat as a function of theta so you can start to think about these we're going to do them in class and work as a team and with uh, other classmates to really get a handle on this stuff. But I just wanted to show you what we're going to work on so you're thinking about it. So that's all we have for this lesson. Uh, I hope you enjoyed listening to it this way, and I will see you in class where we'll work on some of these problems. Thanks, everybody.